We took a look at design rules as a general concept, and we also took a look at two special types of design rules, density rules and antenna damage rules. Now we want to take a look at more general design rules, not special design rules. These are the rules that have to do with the sizes and the separations of, of uh, the different layers in a layout. And we have two types of design rules, scalable design rules and unscalable design rules. Unscalable design rules will, will uh, state the sizes and the, uh, the dimensions and the separations of, of tracks in a layout in terms of micrometers. So we'll use absolute units of length to indicate minimum sizes, to indicate minimum separations. This means that an unscalable set of design rules is vendor specific. So it has to do with a specific fab and it's also technology specific. So it has to do with a specific technology node. Whenever the technology node changes or the, the fab changes, we have to change the set of design rules against which we do design rule checks. Scalable design rules, on the other hand, do not state anything in terms of absolute dimensions. Instead, everything is stated as multiples of a constant lambda. This constant lambda is actually equal to half of the minimum channel length that could be fabricated at the technology node. And so, for example, in a 90 nanometer technology, lambda would be 45 nanometers. The advantage of scalable design rules is that they allow us to draw the layout and make the DRC uh, independent from the vendor or the specific technology. And then when we settle on the technology, we can restate everything in terms of nanometers by just uh, uh, substituting for the value of lambda. However, because this is a scalable and general design rule, uh, it is also very conservative. So it will use large separations and large dimensions, much larger than it actually needs. Uh, if we have a vendor specific set of design rules, they will be liberal, they will allow you to do more things and they will guarantee better yield. We will now discuss a set of scalable design rules, SCMOS rules. Uh, they are not very practical, but they are really good at illustrating what design rules are all about. So design rules uh, describe things about layers. So we will take them layer by layer and the rule will be numbered so that the number consists of x dot y. x refers to the layer we are considering and y refers to the serial number of the rule. So rule 1.3 is uh, a rule about layer 1, which is the n well, and it's the uh, third rule uh, to describe the n well. And so when we look at these rules, we will find that everything is stated in terms of lambda and the rules are illustrated on the figure. For example, rule 1.1 states that the minimum width of a well is 12 lambda. So if you want to draw a well, the well has to be at least 12 lambda. It could be greater, but it cannot be smaller. Of course, it uh, goes without saying that everything has to be, every drawn dimension has to be in multiples of lambda. So we cannot use fractional parts. When we have two wells, they have to be separated by at least 18 lambda. But this is only when these two wells are connected to different potentials. Sometimes you can connect the two wells to the same potential. Actually, most of the time when you have an N well, you connect it to VDD. And in that case, the separation would be only six lambda. Um, but if the two wells used different values for supply uh, for the well contact, then you have to separate them by 12 lambda. Uh, rule number four actually uh, refers to multi-well processes in which we have an N-well and could possibly also have a P-well, in which case they could actually be abutted without any separation. Uh, the layers are numbered from uh, bottom to top and they more or less uh, correspond to the order in which layers are fabricated. So layer two is the active layer, sometimes also called the diffusion layer. It's important to understand that this is not the step at which uh, sources and drains are implanted. This is just the step in which the thin oxide is deposited and the field oxide is deposited in a low cost process. So again, uh, the minimum width here is three lambda. Separation between active tracks is three lambda. And the distance between 
a source or a drain and the uh, edge of a well of the opposite type is 6 lambda and also there is a rule about separation between uh, substrate contacts and a well edge which is different from source and drain uh, because notice that the active in the substrate contact is going to be of the opposite type to the source and the drain. Um, rule number 2.3, uh, actually rule number 2.5 is a separation between N plus and P plus actives. We could have N plus and P plus actives in the substrate or the well because we could have sources and drains as well as contacts. Going up, we uh, then fabricate the polysilicon layer and the polysilicon layer has a minimum width of 2 lambda. Notice that there is a separation between uh, polysilicon tracks that is different if these tracks are drawn over uh, an active, this is rule 3.2, or if they are drawn over the field oxide, which is 3.2a. So um, th these two tracks, for example, are forming two transistors. We said that the cardinal rule of layouts is that an intersection of poly and active is going to be a transistor. And so these are two transistors that share a source or a drain, for example. Now, uh, when the active crosses the polysilicon, it has to clear it by at least 3.4, which is 4 lambda. And when poly crosses an active, it has to clear it by at least 3.3, which is 3 lambda. This obviously has to do with uh, misalignment of masks to guarantee that we create a transistor when we want one. Now, rule 3.1 actually tells us that the minimum channel length, which is this, is going to be 2 lambda. But if we go back to the active track, we find that its minimum width is 3 lambda. And this tells us that in scalable CMOS, uh, the smallest W over L that we can create is actually 3 lambda over 2 lambda. So the smallest transistor is 3, three lambda by 2 lambda rather than 2 lambda by 2 lambda. So going up, we now perform the uh, iron implantation through the P-select and N-select masks which also have a minimum uh, dimension. They have a minimum overlap of uh, the active that they contain. And if there is a contact within the active, they also have to have a minimum overlap of that active. Um, then we go to contact layer, which is the uh, just um, higher layer. And we actually have two uh, contact layers. One is contact to uh, active and, one, and the other is contact to uh, poly. These are marked as five and six. And for contacts, it's important to notice that they have an exact size of two lambda by two lambda. This is not a minimum size. A contact has to be two lambda by two lambda. It cannot be three lambda by three lambda or one lambda by one lambda. Now, a contact actually forms a resistive contact between two layers. What if we need to reduce the resistance of this contact? We cannot make the contact larger. What we can do, on the other hand, is use multiple contacts in parallel with each other uh, to create multiple resistances in parallel. So you can use multiple contacts to establish contact between two layers, but you cannot, you cannot increase the size of the contact. There's also a minimum enclosure, which is how much the poly or the active have to clear the contact. And this has to do with misalignment as well as the lateral uh, etching during, uh, during wet etching. Uh, and so we have to clear it by at least one lambda. Now, the layer just above is the metal one layer. It's layer number seven. It has a minimum width of three lambda and a minimum separation of three lambda as well. Now, when it when it has a contact to poly or active, it also has to uh, overlap the contact by at least a single lambda. Now, uh, from metal one to metal two, we have vias, and vias also have an exact size of three lambda by three lambda. They have a separation of three lambda, and they have to be overlapped by the metal contacting them by a single lambda. If there is a contact in the same metal track, then the contact and the via have to be separated by at least two lambda. And there has to be a minimum separation between the via and uh, any polysilicon track on which it is running by at least two lambda. Now we have higher metal layers. In scalable CMOS, we have metal two through uh, metal five. And corresponding to this, we also have uh, vias that connect them. And these are via two uh, through via four. And they have 
uh, design rules that are identical to each other. So minimum width of three lambda, minimum separation of four lambda, which is slightly different from metal one. Um, and we also have the final metal layer, which is metal six, and the final via, which is via five, which have a slightly larger design rule. This highest metal layer is uh, usually used to uh, route power, ground, and sometimes the clock network. And so it needs to be uh, big. It's also usually very thick to reduce its resistance. There's one final layer, which is sometimes um, uh, used. It's also, it's called the over glass layer. It's a very thick layer of uh, silicon dioxide, which is deposited on top of the wafer, once uh, on top of the chip, once it's fully fabricated. And its only job is to protect the die from scratches. Now, um, when you look at a transistor, it's, a, it's an intersection between a poly uh, track and um, an active track. And so let's actually uh, draw this in color. So it's an intersection between a poly track and an active track. And so we saw that this dimension is at least three lambda and this dimension is at least two lambda. And the typical shape of a transistor that you see in the layout will also include a square in the active layer, which is used to uh, accommodate a contact, usually to a metal layer, which is then used to connect the sources and the drains of the transistors. Uh, because these contacts are two lambda by two lambda, and they have to be cleared by at least one lambda. So this whole thing then is four lambda. And using these dimensions and using the amount of uh, distance that uh, poly and active have to clear each other, you can calculate the minimum area that a transistor can occupy in a layout. And it turns out it is much bigger than the area of the channel. And so when we calculate the area of a transistor is approximately W times L, this is actually a very small area and is not representative of the area of the transistor. It is not even useful as an apples to apples comparison of the areas of different logic gates.